This is Anna Adamek in Vancouver, August 29th, 2017. Hello. Uh, could you give me your name and tell me where you were born? My name uh, is James Douglas Boyd, and I was born in Timmins, Ontario. Uh, could you talk a bit about your childhood? Uh, what were your interests like when you were a child? Uh, my childhood. Uh, well, it started in Timmins, but we moved uh, shortly thereafter to Toronto and later to a uh, small town, Font Hill, in the Niagara Peninsula. So my childhood uh, stretched over those places. Um, I want to say a little bit, why did we move from Timmins to Toronto? My mother died when we were very young, so it was a, a forced move and my father relocated. And I and my sister were placed and lived with for a number of years, uh, an aunt and uncle, my father's unmarried uh, brother and sister. So uh, my childhood was uh, interesting, a bit non-conventional uh, uh, in that respect. And I, um, I bring all this up because it uh, essentially provided uh, exceptional uh, freedom and independence for me. My, uh, my aunt and uncle were very uh, dutiful, but uh, I had a rather privileged uh, uh, or exceptional uh, childhood up to about age uh, 12 when my uh, father remarried and we moved to Niagara and uh, it was maybe more conventional. Anyhow, to answer your question about what uh, uh, what did I do as a child? Uh, I suppose all the ordinary things that uh, people did at that time, uh, the 1940s, uh, but it was certainly uh, different from today uh, in that uh, we, everyone had exceptional freedom, children, to, uh, uh, to make their own fun and create their own fun. So uh, in Toronto, we ran around uh, the nearby parks and, uh, and then got farther away to High Park and, and so on. Um, no television, uh, ex etc. Uh, me specifically, I, uh, I, I took great interest and had opportunity to, to take things apart and, and people would say, oh, this is characteristic of future engineers. Uh, uh, so uh, there was that, but I, I must point out I, I wasn't very good at putting things back together again uh, or to build things, so I, I certainly didn't have that skill. Um, I took piano lessons, so there was that discipline. I had a stamp collection. I uh, was sent to or went to a summer camp in Muskoka for most of those years, and that was a very strong experience. I learned outdoor skills and a love for the outdoors and so on. And uh, your, uh, was anyone within your family interested in science or encouraged you to? Oh, I didn't say. My father was a metallurgical engineer, so I, I guess it's in my genes to, uh, to a degree. What was his name? Um, John. John Boyd. Um, and so he certainly uh, did all the uh, right things to encourage me. I, uh, I was given chemistry sets and building sets and microscope and things like that. Uh, and eventually, uh, after my father remarried, I, I think by this time he had decided that I was uh, succeeding well in school and, and so this sort of encouragement. I think he backed off a bit and and I sense or I recall he he decided I like maybe a lot of young people at that age needed more encouragement to know what's going on in the world so he I recall he encouraged or tried to encourage me to read his uh, Time magazine and Maclean's and, and so on. Uh, but yes I had that encouragement. Could you tell me about your education? Um, I, I want to point out that I feel I benefited greatly by the excellent public education system available in, in Ontario. Um, so as I say, I went to public school in Toronto, I went to high school in this uh, 
smaller, essentially rural uh, area in the Niagara Peninsula. But in retrospect, the, uh, the quality of education was excellent. The teachers were excellent. May maybe uh, good students got the better teachers, but uh, I have nothing but high regard for, for that experience. I, so in high school, I, I guess, gravitated toward the physical sciences and maths uh, rather than biology and chemistry possibly because it was more precise and had a right answer, you know, but uh, that's... And yet university? Uh, you're probably not surprised. My father, as I said, was a metallurgical engineering. Can I just... Uh, so how about university? So from what I've just said, you're probably not surprised, perhaps I did not say, my, my father was a graduate of the University of Toronto. So it's probably not surprising that I, I went to University of Toronto and took engineering. Um, I uh, took and enrolled in uh, engineering physics, uh, probably because it, it advertised as a, an elite program and you required uh, somewhat higher grades uh, for admission and uh, this this appealed it, it also was a little less uh, uh, confining maybe than other engineering programs the the possibilities were more broader and, and more open-ended uh, so that's uh, that's where I went that was the program it was uh, challenging. I don't think I thought a lot about what I was uh, going to do subsequently. Uh, one other very important influence though, so my father worked for this small steel company in the Niagara Peninsula in Welland and th this company despite its, its smaller size um, was very progressive in the sense it offered scholarships, university scholarships, to uh, children of employees. So what was the name of the company? The company was Atlas Steels, and I believe it still exists in some forms, uh, reduced in size, but it uh, has been struggling like a lot of steel companies, uh, uh, but, it, but it's still there. But it, uh, as I said, uh, was very enlightened in its uh, policies at the time and had a great influence on, on me. So uh, firstly, uh, I uh, had the benefit of this scholarship, but it included employment at the steel company. So I worked uh, as a student, a student employee for four summers. And I would say this had a significant influence on uh, my interest in, in thinking. So. Uh, First of all, uh, seeing this industrial plant and the activities there really developed my interest in metallurgy, uh, both from the industrial production, but also uh, the uh, the details of the of the metallurgy, what the metallurgists did there. And As a student, what did you do? Well, they, they were very uh, wise and that each summer uh, I and the other students uh, were assigned to a different area. So uh, I think the first summer and the last summer I, uh, I was attached to a, a metallurgist and followed him around and maybe in the, in the later years I could actually do some useful things. Um, but other times I I was uh, assigned to other engineering areas, say uh, uh, design areas and repair, more mechanically engineering. And, uh, you know, this helped me decide I liked the metallurgy part better than the mechanical engineering. Um, so that, uh, uh, that really is what directed me towards, towards metallurgy. Uh, the engineering physics program had a physical metallurgy option, which I opted for in the uh, final two years. Um, 
but the uh, choice to continue to grad school, a PhD, and so on, uh, that came, you know, toward the end of undergraduate years, as it does with most people. But the one uh, event that I recall is I attended a lecture by a visiting scientist from NASA, the U.S. Space Agency, uh, and so this was 1960. This was the height of the space race when uh, uh, the U.S. and the USSR were competing to put uh, vehicles into space, but mainly to get to the moon. And this scientist from NASA came and, and gave this visiting lecture, which I attended, and I came away from that saying, this is what I want to do. I want to be a scientist like him. So I then was on my way to a, to a PhD. Um, I went to uh, University of Cambridge in England. Uh, why? Uh, I was uh, well advised by a professor, a very important mentor in my life, uh, Professor Bill Weingard at the University of Toronto. So when I discussed with him my interest in a PhD, he, with no hesitation, said, you must go to the metallurgy department at the University of Cambridge. Think, why? Thinking about it, uh, he felt and knew this was the best in the world, in the Western world, and, and he certainly assisted me, and uh, that's where I went. So you would say he was one of your most memorable supervisors? Uh, yes, for sure. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me more about him? About him? He, well, he was very wise, of course, and, and, and very direct. Um, he uh, had great success subsequently in his life. He uh, eventually became president of the uh, University of Guelph. He was a member of parliament from Guelph, I believe, uh, federal parliament for uh, a number of years. So uh, an outstanding person, but uh, certainly one of the people that stand out in my recollection of my career. Who do you consider your mentors? Well, I expect there have been many. Um, like everyone, I there were outstanding uh, uh, teachers in, in high school, but at university, the, the person that stands out in my mind is uh, Professor Bill Weingard, who uh, was the leading, I guess, or professor with the engineering physics program, and in particular, the metallurgy department at the University of Toronto. And for me, he was the person that, with no hesitation, uh, recommended and directed me toward uh, Cambridge University uh, for a PhD in postgraduate work, uh, simply because in his mind it was the best place in the world at the time. Um, so after you finished university, where did you start your teaching career, or did you first work in the industry? Um, yes. So I. My line is that I have worked in industry, and government research labs, and university, uh, and in that order. So, upon completing my PhD in Cambridge, so my wife and I, and we had our first child at that time, uh, had a number of choices, as one, one does uh, at that stage. Uh, but I worked first with a uh, private research uh, company and uh, research lab in the United States, uh, Battelle Memorial Institute, it was called at the time, in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and I subsequently uh, moved to Ottawa and worked for a government research lab, uh, which is now CANMET, it was called something else at the time, and subsequently to Queens. Do you remember anything about your first day at work in the U.S.? Um, I remember, well, that would be my first day of real employment. 
uh, I remember arriving there, uh, but nothing particular. I think it was just the ordinary of uh, uh, filling forms and, and so on. I, um, as a uh, Canadian, and this laboratory uh, at the time, uh, much of the work is uh, government uh, supported and uh, there was quite a uh, strict, certainly to me, uh, coming into this for the first time, security system. And so as a Canadian, I was described, I was a foreign national and had to wear a special colored badge. So I can remember having to go on here and getting that. But that was... Uh, and what were your responsibilities at work? Well, I was... A first, first there, then at Cal yeah. CalMet. Yes, well, uh, I was a research scientist, as I uh, was uh, to be all my life. I guess at the university, uh, teaching becomes another responsibility. Um, so, at this time, uh, much of the, uh, the work that was at this lab, it was obviously in a metallurgical group, that's why I was there, but was related to, was supported by the U.S. government through various agencies, military, NASA, uh, atomic energy, uh, and so on. Uh, and so I was working, I was hired uh, to work on a contract supported by uh, NASA, had to do with some components for the space mission, the Apollo mission that was eventually to go to the moon. Um, but for me it was a metallurgical problem uh, on titanium alloys. So I got to learn about titanium alloys and did things there. Um, but by virtue of living and working there, I like to think I, I learned it was part of my education and experience of, of life in a private contract research lab where you had to think uh, very seriously about income where the money was coming from and it was our my wife and I eventually children experience of, of living in the United States this was the 1960s the, during the Vietnam Vietnam War it was a very interesting time to be there and have political discussions over here with people and so on so when did you move back to Canada and why did you choose to come back? 1972, and I, I could be glib and say, oh, uh, the opportunity arose, and I went, but no, it was more conscious than that, and I, I will say it was my wife that uh, was encouraging me uh, to uh, look for a position in, in Canada. She felt maybe more strongly than I did that uh, our wonderful experience in the U.S. We <laughs> perhaps should uh, return home. Our children were coming of the age to begin school and so on and so forth. So maybe that's what got it going. And um, uh, I started looking for a position and, and something came up. That, I know, that was the... What, what was the culture like then at CADMET comparing to a private industry in the U.S.? Um, different. Uh, I guess the uh, CAMMED, it, it was more, it was a government uh, laboratory and it was more structured in uh, civil service sort of way, I guess, and that it was the director and subdirectors and groups and, and so on. Uh, apart from that, uh, you know, research labs and research are very similar wherever you are, so what you're doing and how you're doing it, the equipment and so on, is, is quite similar. I suppose the main difference would be, though, now that I think of it, as I said a moment ago, it, at Battelle, the, the laboratory in the U.S., the work was all funded by research contracts, and so the, the scientists, really the first responsibility 
was to obtain enough contracts to support your operation. So, so you had that responsibility. And as always, at some times you were well funded, and other times you weren't, and maybe had to go on. Uh, uh, CAMET, uh, the Physical and Metallurgy Research Labs at the time, uh, that was not a concern. This was maybe it was a concern for the director of the lab, but for the researchers, the budget was there and so on. So that would be that would be a big difference. Uh, ultimately, you chose uh, academic career. Why? Uh, I'm not sure. Can I go back to Camet a little bit and, and just? Uh, uh, say a bit about the work there because it, it, uh, it, it certainly had an impact on, on me. So I, I, I told you about what prompted me, us, to, uh, to look for this position, but I found out when I arrived there that it was a remarkable time for this lab, this government metallurgy lab in, in Ottawa, that they were in the process or, in process, or had just hired something like seven or eight new scientists, I was one of them, all to work on pipeline steel. So at this time, 1972, there was a big plan for a Arctic gas pipeline. And some wise person in this government lab decided they would build up a group of metallurgists of expertise and strength in this area, both to assist the Canadian steel companies that were manufacturing steel to make the pipe and also to support the regulatory. So it was a, an amazing time of all these new people starting this work, new equipment. It was ideal for a young research scientist to sort of come in and with all these facilities, begin to do research on steel. So this is really where I started my research in steel, and that's what I've been doing ever since then, ever for the rest of my life. Yes. And that's, of course, a very important part of Canadian history. Well, uh, I think those, so. Those uh, um, Mackenzie pipeline. This, and, uh, well, people have looked at the outcomes of this and so on, but you can imagine that with this number of people. Now, uh, at the same time, the Canadian universities, there were a number of uh, people and, and research groups starting and growing in the same area. And so not so many years later, uh, Canada, I hate to say were world leaders, but they certainly were doing, well, yes, I think they, they, were, they were with the world leaders in <coughs> excuse me, research on uh, line pipe steel and steels re uh, related to uh, to that type of product, uh, UBC, McMaster, McGill, it it was uh, a very uh, special time in Canadian metallurgy, I think, uh, to. Uh, point at a bit of <coughs> history if you're uh, not aware. So I think it was 1985 uh, and there was a Canadian Steel Research Association. This is an industrial based research association for steel companies which does not exist anymore. Um, but organized by this group and a man, Jock Mackay, um, at Stelco, uh, there was a it was like a two-week visit to Japan, but a seminar uh, with the Japanese Iron and Steel Association. Uh, of all of these Canadian researchers, university, CANMED, industrial people, so it, it showed what a strength in this area Canada had at the time. What were the main challenges, 1970s, early 1980s, when it comes to steel production, what were the challenges you were working on? Technical challenges. I, I guess uh, uh, most metallurgical materials used in structural applications, uh, well, in structural applications, uh, 
you are trying to develop materials or improve the materials that you increase the strength, you increase or maintain the resistance to fracture or other failures happening, and the cost must be a consideration, especially if you are a steel company producing it. So it was, it was dealing with those challenges, which are the standard. You could read the same thing in the textbook 50 years ago, probably. Um, but it was a one of these special times for a number of reasons. Uh, one, there was, uh, I'll say, revolutionary advances in the steel production technology. This was not my area of uh, of expertise per se, but but how you made the steel and uh, and cast it, and and there are a number of these uh, professors and universities in Canada that I referred to that were experts in this area and uh, and were, uh, their research was uh, addressing these problems. Uh, <clears throat> what I and others were involved with was more the, uh, call it downstream processing, say uh, hot rolling and heat treating, uh, but predominantly hot rolling. So there was a significant change, I don't want to overuse the word revolutionary, but it was, in the steels themselves. So they're called micro-alloy steels. So they're these new steels that uh, uh, the idea had been developed maybe 10 years earlier. So this was ideal for this pipeline project and all these people that were working. And this was this was more uh, what, this was what, what I am others were working on is how to process, how to roll these microalloyed steels, control the microstructure, so you have to study the microstructure, improve the properties. Sorry yes. to be a bit long-winded. No, no, that, I, did, but, uh, <laughs> I did want to hear about that. Yeah. Um, you also work on metal matrix composite materials. Could you tell me more about that research? Um, I will, a little bit. It, this was, uh, I, I started and did this when I first moved to Queens. But in fact, it was a relatively short-lived uh, area of my research. Um, uh, Alcan, I believe it was still Alcan at the time, uh, had a uh, technology for manufacturing these aluminum base or aluminum matrix, metal matrix composites. Uh, and, uh, and so it was, it was sort of natural for me to uh, start up uh, and others uh, research in this area. Um, the materials are readily available from, uh, from Alcan, but I, I really, the work that I did uh, was really using these materials as a model material to study the, the fracture behavior of, of materials in general with a soft matrix and hard particles in it and so on. Uh, so it was relatively short-lived. I don't have a lot more to say about it. So now going back to your academic career, why did you choose academia versus industry? All right. Ultimately. Yes. Um, I, again, and, and maybe this is just me by nature, it, it was not a planned, uh, you know, long-term plan that uh, after so many years here I would, I would move there. Um, the, uh, the opportunity arose, I was approached and uh, for various reasons. It was that time when our children were going off to university and so it, uh, it was appropriate or whatever. Um, and, and so uh, I moved, I accepted. It was a new challenge, it was exciting. Um, again, thinking about it, uh, maybe not so many years later, um, I realized that I had traded this well-structured uh, life at CanMet where uh, I had access to uh, really all of the facilities and equipment and, and 
pilot scale equipment, what, what we call where you can make relatively large amounts of steel. They had furnaces, you could make whatever composition you wanted and, and ways to roll it and study it in microscopes and many technicians and so on. So I traded that for the uh, much, I'm going to say, smaller scale uh, research at a, at a university, less equipment, no technicians to speak of, but uh, many uh, enthusiastic grad students, uh, albeit temporary. Uh, so it's, it's a different, uh, the world needs both types of did, did, so when you work for CanMet, you of course had a relationship with academia too, through your colleagues. When you work at Queen's, what was the relationship like with industry and with government organizations? Okay, I'll, um, many of the, these uh, questions you're posing to me, I, I get to them eventually, but I say <laughs> something first. So sure. I'm going to do the same here. So when I was at, at CanMet, I in retrospect, I, I think I, I felt when I when I thought about it that I mean we were doing a lot of work in this area that I've talked about. We studied it. We gave presentations at conferences and wrote papers and and published and and so on. But I I, I think I I had the feeling that I I wasn't really drilling down deeply into the the mechanisms of what was going on, you know, that level of research. And and I probably got this thinking by listening to my colleagues in the universities of what they were doing in their presentations and, and so on. So uh, that may have been part of the reason to say, okay, maybe I should uh, move to the academic side and, and try that. and and. I guess thinking about it now, uh, that was uh, accurate in that uh, the work that I and one does at university, you certainly, even though it was in this, the same field essentially, uh, with students and postdoctoral researchers, you certainly do study the more fundamental aspects as you're expected to. That's what I do. What is the innovation or set of innovations that you are the most proud of or research that, that you think had the biggest impact? Well, I've been accused of over modesty. I, you know, I, I may say, so please don't be uh, modest. Say right it's here. well deserved. I, this is for future. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yes. I, well, um, so what was my area of, of research? I, I described it in general in processing microstructure properties of steel, but you know, what did I and my colleagues and students and so on really, really do? Well, we, we used uh, simulations, laboratory simulations to simulate the processing that occurs in the, in the steel mill. Um, so this is done on a relatively small scale, but to to be able to control the conditions of temperature and deformation of your material, particular composition, and then to study in detail using state-of-the-art uh, microscopes and to relate this to the mechanical properties. So I, I think to characterize my research uh, uh, briefly, I I did that, but usually or maybe always in conjunction with with the steel company, with an industry uh, that was going to use this particular material and so on. So uh, basically, there would be a particular problem, or a particular situation to be addressed, or where there was an area of possibility of advance. And what we would do in the laboratory was to do laboratory simulation experiments and microstructure and, and so on. Um, so you asked about, you know, what am I most proud of? I guess I'm, I'm proud of the overall outcome of, of all of that. But to give you uh, 
you know, an example of a, a success uh, story. Um, so it was with a postdoctoral researcher, uh, Elena Paraloma, and, and she has had an interesting story. So she came from Ukraine. I had obtained this uh, research grant to do this uh, research with one of the steel companies. Can I name the steel company? Yes, it, absolutely. It was, it was Stelco. And so I needed uh, a lead researcher, so I'm then uh, trying to find, and these things are always had to be done relatively quickly or always late or whatever. Anyhow, I heard from one of my colleagues that, a, a, so this was uh, just after the Soviet Union was dissolving, and it was just after the Chernobyl uh, disaster, the reactor in, in Ukraine. And I heard from a colleague uh, that, I'm not sure who did it, it may have been the steel companies, but a group of people brought over a group of scientists, engineers from Ukraine to uh, see about employment in Canada and so on. And, and one of these people, my colleague, knew that I was looking for someone and, and said, oh, you know, you should contact this group, you might find someone. So by the time all of this happened, um, the group was heading back to Ukraine. But anyhow, I, I managed to find that Elena, this woman that I didn't know at the time, was in Ottawa, I was in Kingston. Uh, she was due to, uh, to return to Ukraine the next day and I drove up to Ottawa and, and managed to talk to her in a hotel lobby and, well, the rest is history, as they say, that she came and worked with me and, uh, you know, I quickly found out that she was a superb scientist and knew what she was doing and away she went. But the project she worked on with Stelco was one of these ideal situations, so I would hold it as a textbook for university industry uh, interaction. So she worked closely with the engineer in the strip mill that was responsible for processing and wanted to improve uh, what they were doing, and she carried out laboratory experiments to simulate this and got some very interesting results and published two or three papers on it that were very well received. So, you know, this is a highlight that stands out in my mind. Most of other things I did were very similar, but this one. But she, well, I mentioned Chernobyl, why I subsequently found out. Uh, so she was a single mother. She had a daughter of seven years old, something at the time. And she was very concerned about her daughter living in Ukraine because of the, the fallout from uh, radioactive fallout. Anyhow, um, and she obviously was concerned about her future long-term employment, so while she was doing all this wonderful work with me, um, she was looking around applying for jobs and she obtained a faculty position in Australia. So she went to a university there. She was since moved, but long story short, she has become, not surprising, a research star in Australia and the world of steel wow. research. So that's a great story. That's a success story. Yes, definitely. Her yeah. daughter was just it's all about people. A year ago, yes. Yes. So, what was the most dysfunctional project? Well, I won't go on at at length, but. Uh, what I just said was an example of you know, wonderful, successful project, the way it should work. There was another project not so many years later, uh, also with a steel company, also Stelco, um, and this was, was different steel, on line pipe steel. Um, it, it had all the makings in that we had university industry and CAMMET was involved as, as well, so it was sort of textbook in that regard. But for some reason, as the project progressed over, you know, two or three years, you know, things just weren't working. Communications 
were bad among the various groups. Uh, the industrial partners Stelco seemed to be changing their mind and, and, and so on. Um, and it, we were working on plate steel and so this was to improve their processing for their plate mill where they manufactured the plate. And just as the project was ending, three years to make it normal term, I found out they, they were closing their plate mill. So it, it's sort of a textbook disaster story that, well, you know, I learned subsequently that Stelco was in serious financial problems and not shortly thereafter were taken over by U.S. Steel. So it was really a case of me, us, uh, running this research project with the company that when the company had serious problems and things were that I didn't really know about and I was wondering you know, what was going on with this research project. So, anyway, that's my uh, disaster story. Um, you are an editor of the Canadian Metallurgical Quarterly. What are your goals for this publication? Well, um, my goals is as a concerned citizen now, I guess, but uh, uh, since I'm not uh, directly involved. Um, so, as you know, I'm sure, the Canadian Metallurgical Quarterly, the CMQ, is, uh, is the journal of Met Soccer. It is the Met Soccer journal, I feel. Um, it's a peer-reviewed uh, journal that uh, publishes work across the spectrum of uh, the METSOC, mineral processing, uh, hydro, pyro metallurgy, physical metallurgy, uh, and so on. Uh, it is in a um, difficult or, or challenging uh, uh, situation in that it competes uh, head-on with uh, monthly international journals in in the field, uh, for all these fields that I just I just mentioned, so uh, you know, you ask me uh, what is my uh, view or the goal of the CMQ. I would say survival. Uh, it's it's doing well. Uh, you know, it's always been strongly supported by uh, Metsoc as an organization, but by the people and the researchers that submit their work. So uh, I'm optimistic. I, I think it's doing well and uh, it, uh, it's published by a multinational publisher now, Taylor and Francis, and there. That's a positive thing. So I look forward to many years. I look forward to reading it for many years. <laughs> uh, what are your thoughts on innovation culture in Canada in the past and today? Um, this is an interesting thing. Well, I was going to say for me, but uh, for everyone, I expect. So we all uh, read here. Uh, the 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 topic innovation is uh, much more prevalent now, I think, than uh, than it ever was. And, and I suppose everyone has an opinion, which is is probably a good thing. Um, I, I'm going to say uh, I, I think it's, it's a bit overblown. I think in this, I mean, certainly we, we live and die or succeed or not in the long run based on innovation, being able to improve and ultimately raise our standard of living and so on. The, the question uh, is how you do that, and no one is quite clear, and therefore there's great controversy. So, uh, my feeling is that the you know trying to concentrate on innovation and even the the word, uh, but the process, which to me means oh we have to create an environment, we have to get people that who will think in a way out of the box. And, so on and so forth. Uh, these things are important, but I, I feel we should 
just back off a bit and think about how all of the great innovations have come about that have got us to where we are now. And I think most of them um, come about. Now, they require someone to suddenly say, oh, aha, we, maybe we should try this. We've never tried before. But I think that situation normally arises while people are doing, I'm going to say, normal engineering things or the engineering process. In other words, they're design, using what is your current knowledge and expertise, looking at what are the ways we can advance incrementally and experimenting, trying out these. Now, as long as you have enough people doing that, then every once in a while, somebody will shoot ahead. So, I guess my concern is that people are trying to make the quantum leap at the same time fewer people are doing this base development and I'm concerned about that. I think I agree with you. This, this were very interesting thoughts. Yes. We very much appreciate that. Do you see any change in the way that academic teaching is done now and throughout your career? Well, uh, my career was uh, a second half career of teaching, but nevertheless, uh, uh, absolutely, uh, in uh, very relatively recently, in the past five or ten years, maybe even five years, um, at a time I must say that I have ceased to teach full time, you know, uh, but nevertheless, um, the advances in electronic technology and, and teaching technology, or will call it communication technology and so on, have changed uh, how teaching is done in universities. It can be done uh, tremendously. I mean, uh, online courses, artificial intelligence labs, I don't know, computer-assisted visual aspects in, in lectures and so on. Um, but I feel this, all of these technologies, I'll call them, uh, are just tremendous assists to, to help good teachers teach better. Uh, good teachers will learn how to take advantage of these things and, and use them. Um, so I, I think that's, that's all for a plus. Um, I, it's probably led to, on the average, larger class sizes, especially in maybe first and second year. My experience is just with engineering programs. But nevertheless, I, I think overall it will improve the educational experience and accomplish things because it's really, these are really tools used by good teachers. You are an academic, you work with industry, you work with the government, so what would you say to a young student of metallurgy today? What advice would you give them? I'm going to have a short answer for a change, but possibly because that's the most challenging uh, question we have here, Anna. Um, and it really relates back to what I was saying about uh, Professor Bill Weingart when he was advising me. And that is, and, and I say this often to uh, students who are thinking of graduate studies and are looking, you know, where should I do my graduate studies? Find the number one expert in the world that is in your field or topic of interest and communicate, establish a relationship, go and work with him or her. And learn it's an excellent advice. As a historian of technology, I would be really interested in knowing what you consider um, events that we must study, that we must remember in the history of metallurgy in the development of metallurgy in Canada. 
either successes or, or fail, failures. Uh, so I, I'm going to uh, uh, cop out as an old expression <laughs> on that. I, I guess I have not spent enough time yet researching <laughs> the history myself to, to know. Um, but within you know, your the career. things that have happened within my career, and I, well, there are, there are many things. I, I didn't use the term Sputnik in, in our discussion, but uh, that uh, had an important time. But that wasn't a uh, Canadian, uh, per se. I'm going to uh, refer you to this document that was produced uh, three or four years ago on the 50th anniversary of the METSOC where uh, a number of people put together and, and we all contributed to it. Um, now, that was looking at the past 50 years, but that, uh, that certainly uh, covers that in terms of the highlights. Uh, if I have any uh, other ideas of significant things that have not been discovered by the historians, I will email you. Thank you. <laughs> what are you proudest of in your life? In my life? Yes. In my life. Um, I will say what you can expect is, is my family, uh, my, my wife, two daughters and now their families, grandchildren. Uh, I mean, this is a very human thing, but I must say, since you asked, uh, that's the number one thing in my life. Uh, neither of our two daughters went anywhere near engineering, uh, but I take that as a sense of their independence of thinking and intelligence and, and so on. I'm uh, watching with interest our grandchildren as they're approaching uh, their university uh, decisions and, and so on. But anyhow, uh, uh, my wife has been a incredible support to me through all of the uh, things that we've been uh, talking about here, uh, the move from Ottawa to Kingston when I went to Queens uh, created some difficulty for her. She had a very good job in, in Ottawa and so on and so forth, but uh, you know, that was not an issue. Um, what am I proud of in, in, in my work? Uh, I don't know. We've talked about what sort of things I, I did. I guess just being able to participate in that and do it. I enjoyed it. Uh, is there anything else you would like to add? I can't think of it. Thank you. Thank you.